Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I am Prashant with me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, morning. morning. Uh, what a wild ride we've been having, up and down and up and down, over and over again. Last three days are the case in point. Uh, you know, and it began last Thursday with that super, super rally with a near 3% pop. Uh, we, and then Friday, we had that 2.5% uh, drop, almost taking off all of the gains from the previous day. And this, yesterday, you have a 2.6% rally once again. You know, day-on-day -day change. Forget about what happened uh, from intraday lows or intraday highs. Day-on-day, -day, uh, this totals up to a 6% move on the largest equity index in the world, uh, the S&P 500. So this has uh, been a bit of a wild ride. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's uh, what we have. But the question for us really is, are some of these global issues going to get out of our way? Are we set for a bit of a clean run here? Uh, the SGX is indicating that 150 odd points higher after a decent session yesterday, 17,400. And 61. Sonia, hi. Nigel, hi. Hi, Prashant. Good morning, Nigel. Morning. morning. And the other big question that we're asking is, is the risk on back in the U.S. market, yes. right? I mean, it may be too soon to tell, but there are some signs that are indicating that. The dollar index, for one, has come off definitely uh, from the highs of 111. Uh, the Dow Jones, as pointed out earlier, a sharp surge is what we saw overnight. Um, not just that, you know, the Nasdaq has seen its best day, I think, since the month of July. Uh, so is risk on back? In our own markets, uh, the FI selling has reduced quite a bit, so which is great news for the bulls. Yesterday, FI sold just about 370 crores, while DR has bought a huge chunk, almost 1,600 crores. And I think the average selling of FIs in the last five or six trading sessions has been in excess of 1,000, 1,500 crores. So this uh, come off is, is quite positive for our own markets. A couple of levels that you can watch on the upside. A firm line in the sand on the downside, as we know, is the 200-day moving average. But on the upside, the 50-day moving average of 17,490 is going to be tracked very closely. And the high of October 6, somewhere to the tune of 17,330, perhaps is the next mark to watch on the upside. But for today, definitely the day, the start of the day could belong to the bulls. And then we'll take it from there because there's still a lot of volatility, right? We're dealing with our own earnings on one hand. And then on the other hand, there's so much turmoil in the global markets that still exist. You know, uh, I'm just hoping that some of these global issues just stay aside for some time yeah. and we r run ahead. You know, a bit of a clean run here. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because, uh, you know, to begin with, as I said, there's that 6% move we've seen in the last uh, three sessions. Uh, sometimes what happens is markets, when they're trying to base out, uh, do give you these kind of extreme volatility days. Uh, it's happened here. It's happened uh, in the U.S. Pr uh, you know, prior to this as well in previous episodes. Uh, so 2% up, 2% down, 2% up again. Uh, the, the last direction is up. Uh, and that's the reason why I'm saying that maybe, just maybe, uh, this run uh, may extend. You don't have very much by, by way of top-tier data. When I say top-tier data, you don't have like a big CPI number or a jobs report this week. So, you know, there is little in terms of data which could interrupt this uh, run higher. Uh, technically as well, positioning across equities remains quite short. I'm talking about U.S., uh, and uh, this has been true last week, the week before that. And that is the reason why, naturally, many were expecting things to turn around prior to CPI or prior to jobs report. It did not happen. Maybe this is the time it will happen. Uh, again, sticking with technicals, NASDAQ 100 is closed above a psychological re horizontal resistance at about 11,050. Uh, 11, this is the NASDAQ 100. On the S&P 500, the level to watch is the October 2022 highs, which stands at 3,820. You know, you basically, the, the market here has been doing very well, relative outperformance. So it's not as if it's been falling like nine pins because U.S. is falling. But what if the global setup becomes a little more constructive? It adds to the confidence that you don't have to watch your, sort of, you know, watch your back to say if uh, another train is coming our way and you'll get a big down day, uh, etc. So... Uh, that, that is essentially the point I'm focusing and kind of sort of laying out these levels in the U.S. as well. So the relative outperformance in India is extremely apparent. Oil prices, and I've made this point again and again, actually in this cycle, what has remained pa of paramount importance more than the dollar index, at least in terms of channels through which these global macros hit us, oil has trumped the dollar and everything else. Oil is well behaved. It's under $92 on the Brent. Uh, and I think uh, that is good. That is a very, very good uh, you get a gap up, and I think the question becomes what to do. You'll start above last Friday's high. You'll start above the 50% retracement of the September fall as well, which stands at 17,421. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, this, this could be an interesting session on the upside. 
you are basically looking at uh, the next level at about uh, the 17,491, which is nothing but the 50-day moving average as well. Actually, three you, you're basically going to be knocking around those levels if SGX, uh, the opening on SGX is to be believed. Uh, banks continue to be the favorite area. And I think, uh, you know, it was apparent yesterday as well. PSU Bank Index ended up 4%. The private bank index was up 2.5%. Uh, and uh, financials are perhaps the most attractive hunting ground if you're looking for mispriced opportunities. Valuation-wise, they still remain uh, below where they were a couple of years ago or their median valuations as well. Uh, so, you know, just a couple of things. But banks, I think, continue to be an attractive uh, area to look for opportunities. SGX indicating a 140-point higher start. Nigel, what are we watching? Well, yeah, you know, the Nifty and the Nifty Bank, they're like two batsmen, right? They're batting in there. The Nifty Bank is in splendid touch. It's gone ahead and conquered those two technical levels, the 20 DMA and the 50 DMA. Now it's looking at the non-strike and saying, your turn. Nifty, it's time for you to go towards that 50 DMA. Whether or not the Nifty can get there and trade about those levels, that's going to be extremely crucial. But the setup is good. U.S. markets are good overnight handover is what we've got. The dollar index hovering around that 112 watt mark. Brent as well pretty much under control at around $92 per barrel. Remember, you had some comments that came in from the U.K. finance minister. Jeremy Hunt, they said that all those tax cuts will be scrapped. So that's why you saw some strength on the pound. And that's why, in fact, you know, the dollar index is at around that 112 watt. The shots could be forced to get squeezed out. And that's going to be the most important play in trade today. Institutional data for the last couple of days has been good because the DI buying has outweighed the FI selling. So they're bought for two straight sessions. Remember, prior to that, the net sell number from institutions was around 400 crores odd. On the FI side, in the, in the index futures, well, there was some mild short covering that we saw. And it was clear, the Nifty Bank, that's coming in for a bit of a short squeeze because the open interest was down out there and the index did surge up. And now the short positioning is down. From around 85%, it's come down to around 76%. The uh, biggest positive for me, though, is the way they're writing puts. And yesterday as well, they wrote puts big time. The 17,300 puts, 17,200 put. Between them, there was 50 lakh shares getting added. So there's an attempt that the bulls are saying that 16,950, maybe we'll move the base up a little bit. That's the sense you got. And, and the put writing is really hardening. But in case things go wrong, there is some put buying as well that we have seen. The key factor to focus on now, the Nifty Bank, it's got, you know, the momentum going with it. Will it move towards the fresh all-time highs? That's close to around 41,850-odd. That's a level we were just in the last month or so. If that happens, then you can see the Nifty drifting up as well. For today, we're opening up near that resistance zone, the 50 DMA. That's at around 17,491, so keep an eye on that mark. If we can conquer that level and trade above that level, say for the first couple of hours, then you're gradually going to be making that dash to around 17,700 from where last time around we did take a turnaround. So good to see HGX Nifty. Uh, you know, indicating some follow through today, but sustaining this gap, most crucial. Okay, so I like that we're talking about all time highs in the market, right? It's a great time to be talking about it as we're heading into Diwali as well. I mean, the bulls have it at least today, and we're not too far away from that all time high on the Nifty as well. 18,600 was the 52 week high that we hit. We're what, about uh, 1,300 points away from that. But purely for today, it's a 140 point bump up that we're looking at, and things have cooled off on the dollar index as well. Just wanted to mention that. So, 111 was the high that uh, the dollar index had hit. Uh, it's cooled off, so the chart should come up for you. 100, okay, now it's still high at 112.17. But uh, anyway, let's see how things stabilize. Uh, for now, um, there is green across the screens. But on the equities front, uh, first up, we have a view coming in from Gautam Duggar of Motilal Oswal, who expects the markets to be range-bound till a clear trend emanates from the results season. He says banking results have been very strong so far, while early IT results have marginally beaten expectations. He also says global choppiness could continue and geopolitics, commodities and central bank action can keep the markets volatile in the short term. We'll get you some money market views as well. Bhaskar Panda of HTFC Bank says, Confusion reigns, reigns over markets as policy seesaw continues in certain geographies. He adds, yesterday, Britain's new finance minister made a U-turn on recent changes in financial policy, pushing the pound up, and oil also receded a bit. This should ideally help the USD INR, which traded in a narrow range yesterday. He says, uh, Bhaskar adds, uh, that the, the, he expects the pair, the dollar rupee, to trade in a range of between 82.15 to 82.35 for the day. And on the bond market, you have uh, Bhaskar Panda giving us his comment saying that the latest MPC minutes show a divergence of views amongst MPC members on further rate hike trajectory, which has helped the yields come down a bit. He expects the 10-year benchmark yield to consolidate within a range of 7.38 to 7.42%. 
Well, we have a lot of stock specific action as well, and we'll get to that in just a bit. But for the time being, we're running you through the top 10 stocks that we're focusing on. We're looking at Z Entertainment, Maharashtra Seamless, Gujarat Gas, Aster DM, SJVN, Adani Transmission, and Concar. They are the stocks that are likely to open up in the green. On the flip side, there's some disappointments. Ambarita Madhusan, uh, you had Canfin Homes as well as Tata Coffee. They are stocks that are likely to see a bit of a red tick to kickstart trade. <coughs> All right, uh, Matt Orton is now joining us. He's Ch Chief Market Strategist at uh, Carolyn Tower uh, Advisors. Matt, great to have you back on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, you've been more constructive than not uh, the last uh, few times that we've spoken with you. Uh, what, what should we make of uh, the U.S. market action to begin with? Are we basing out a little bit around the 3,500 mark on the S&P? What's your sense? Hey, good morning. It's great to be back. And I think markets are going to be pretty choppy. It's nice that we're starting to see the micro take over from the macro, which has just been so pervasive and so negative for a really, really long time. And now that we're finally into earnings season, we're getting a preview yet again that corporate America is in decent shape. And we're also seeing that play out around the rest of the world so far. So the fundamentals are still, I think, in the favor of long term upside for the overall market. The challenge is that they're the macro headwinds are just incredibly pervasive right now. Mm. And it's a little bit difficult for me to get too constructive on the market right now when the CPI and inflation data last week was just not very, very good. And on top of that, you're still not seeing enough easing of inflation to allow the Federal Reserve to step back. Once we finally get a sense of when the Fed is going to step back and what the ultimate terminal rate is going to be, that's when the markets can finally start to rally. Once we get that clarity, I think it's time to, to have upside. And that's why when I talk to a lot of our clients, the main message that I'm giving them is continue to play defense. Don't chase the market higher uh, because it's really, really hard to tell what's going to be a head fake and, and when a sustainable rally is actually going to occur. So stay in the game, lean into growth at a reasonable price, lean into dividend growers, lean into higher quality companies with free cash flow, stronger ROE, earning stability. But at the same time, if you want to start wading into the market, look for really, really compelling valuations. The small cap part of the U.S. market, I think, makes a lot of sense. Sure. For global investors, I think emerging markets, which have sold off really hard, make a lot of sense focusing on India and Latin America. I still like both of those a lot moving forward. Okay, India and Latin America. You said the magic words. Matt, good morning. So you're saying don't chase the market, be defensive, stick with high-quality names. Um, I understand that there is lack of clarity on when the next rally may come through. But at least, can you say with some degree of certainty that the worst of the bear market is now behind us, both in the U.S. as well as in emerging markets? You know, Sonia, I think so. When you look at the overall market and a run-of-the-mill recessionary drawback call on the S&P 500, it tends to be 24% when you look at post-World War II recession. So when you don't have severe, I'll say, financial calamity like we had in 2008 and 2009, which I really do not believe is going to be the case, we're already there. We've already had those sorts of pullbacks. So the market right now just needs to find some stability. As long as we can stay above 3550 on the S&P 500, which is around the 38.2 retracement, I think that sets up some nice support. And if we can clear 3800 on the S&P 500 or 3820, that I think sets up for a more sustainable rally where I would get more confident in the gains going forward. But still, it is not time to be hitting the sell button. If anything, the risk reward looks more and more compelling each day the market goes down. All right, Matt, uh, you know, sounding fairly uh, more constructive than on the, you know, equity markets and more bullish, I would say, leaning towards bullish rather than bearish, though, with a bit of a cost, uh, co uh, you know, cautious stance. Matt, you know, you're in the camp that believes that Indian IT companies that have been, you know, big <laughs> underperformers this year so far, it's time to buy them. You think all the bad news is in the price? I think a lot of bad news is already in the price. When you look at, particularly in IT services, valuations have come off significantly over the past year. And what's encouraging from India is that, that you're seeing 
IT start to outperform. You're seeing financials and banks in particular outperform. So you're seeing, you're seeing those, I'll call it stocks that haven't been part of the momentum trade for a while start to work again, which is really, really encouraging from a durability standpoint of a rally. And what I like about IT services in particular, especially you know, the big four companies, is, is that a lot of the worst for consulting revenue was already impounded in price. Comps were very, very difficult this year. And I think that the, the worst of, of the economic impact that you're going to see globally that feeds into their revenue is already priced in. So I think we're starting to find a base and investors are looking for opportunities. That's why you're starting to see these stocks move again. Uh, Matt, uh, IT services is doing well three weeks in a row now. Uh, what about uh, the financial space uh, here, Matt? <clears throat> That's uh, another space looking constructive. Good to you. I do like financials and banks, like I said before, I think banks have a lot of room to run. Net interest margins are more constructive and at least the, the difference between loan growth and what they're paying out on deposits continues to increase. So I think that sets up for a really, really good backdrop for the banks. And on top of that, the economy of India is in good shape and financials, which are cyclical and are tied to the overall health of the economy, that continues to be a compelling story, especially relative to the rest of the world. And you're seeing, you're, you're seeing good loan growth coming from small and medium-sized enterprises as well. So when you put all of that together and you look from a valuation perspective as well, that to me seems like a really, really good opportunity and entry point right now to catch it when it's starting to rebound. Well, the going has been good for global markets this morning. There's green across the screen. The SGX Nifty also indicating a bumper start. Uh, crude has fallen. Uh, Brent is now, what, $92 a barrel or thereabouts. And FI selling has reduced in a big way. But here are all the stocks that you need to focus on this morning as we kickstart trade. Uh, Nimesh is here first up with us to tell us about a couple of block deals um, on his radar. Nimesh, over to you. Hi, Sanna. So the first is the entertainment. Uh, I, I, you know, as it was expected for a while now, a large block finally coming through in Z Entertainment. So Invesco is going to sell 5.5% stake via block deal today. The indicative price is between 250 to 263. But I understand the block is likely to happen in the in the pre-open in the block window. So there will be just a 1% discount to yesterday's closing price. Interestingly, there is a 180-day lockup for the seller going forward. And you know, Invesco is holding a little over 10% stake and they are selling 5.5%. So the remaining, uh, you know, 500% cannot be sold for the next six months which means that potentially the next block will come only after the uh, uh, merge entity gets relisted and that is likely to come in mid january so uh, and also because of the ba you know base equity going up there will be further reduction in invesco stake so looks like it's a clean out trade from invesco to start with and it's most likely going to happen in a block window and hence uh, uh, after the block looks like the stock will react positively uh, into this trade so that's that's the first block the second is on samandra madasan uh, there's there is a block deal in, the, in that company as well and FI is looking to sell close to 2% stake uh, via block deal. Uh, the floor price is 64.5, which suggests a 7% discount to yesterday's closing price. Now, uh, they own 3.5% stake in the company, and there is a 90-day lockup. So further 1.5% cannot come for the next three months. But given the deep discount, the stock may open in the red. So green for Z Entertainment and red for Samandra International. Mm. You know, the Z, uh, Nimesh, uh, hang in there. We've spoken about, Nimesh has highlight, had highlighted that this may happen. I mean, uh, people were talking about this uh, for some time. Uh, but, uh, you know, any any reason why they're selling out Nimesh? Or, I mean, I guess you, you, you know, uh, you sell when you want to sell. Uh, they'd sold earlier as well, and uh, they were left, I think, with 10%, right? Correct. So they sold 7.5% stake <coughs> six months back, yeah. and now they're selling another 5.5%. So they'll be left with little, little around 5% stake after this block deal. But, you know, a uh, couple of things. Uh, Prashant, you know, while the market is speculating for a week now yeah. that the block will come, I was very clear that the block can only come after the shareholder meet is yes. over. Now, you know, most of the uh, most of the event is out of the way for Z uh, to yeah. merge with Sony. So that now it will be a procedural thing in the next couple of months. Yeah. The stock will get suspended for a few, uh, few weeks and then will relist. But uh, given that there is a 180-day lockup now, which means that technically no further sell-off can come at least for the next six months. All right. Uh, I mean, you know, the <coughs> point is that you would expect that something like this would assist their opposition to mm -hmm. this uh, Sony merger being over. They would kind of uh, hang in there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, they, are, they, they were waiting, as Nimesh pointed out, and he alerted us earlier as well, that they were waiting for this shareholder approval. And yeah. now, 
uh, they're going to sell that. You know, just one more point, Prashant, yeah. on uh, the futures for the next contract. That's <coughs> November. Yeah. It's a massive uh, open risk build up. Now, going by what Nimesh is saying, that there, there won't be a further selling for the next six months. And the second factor is likely to happen in pre-open as well. So those shots could get stuck out actually on, uh, you know, on the wrong side. Let's keep an eye out on that front as well. November futures should come up new for uh, the Z contract. Big, big open interest build up is what we saw yesterday. That said, let's move on. Abhishek is joining in to tell us about Canfin Homes. Uh, morning, Abhishek. Morning, Nigel. Uh, so it's a mix back coming in from Canfin Homes uh, with business momentum being there, but operating profits are almost flat on a uh, sequential basis. So they have made a standard asset provision of about 33.55 crore, which suggests that they have made some provisions on write-offs that they have done uh, with respect to SMA 1 or 2 accounts. The net interest margin has declined on a sequential basis. Now, this is despite the fact that uh, non-salaried customer segment has actually uh, seen um, better growth than salaried segment. So tax payment is also on the higher side at more than 30% versus 25.8% in the previous quarter. AM growth remained healthy at 22.2% YOI and about 4.7% sequentially. But operating profits grew by a mere 0.5% quarter on quarter. And provision coverage ratio that declined sharply to 43.4% when compared to 54.4% in the previous quarter. Net NPI and absolute value has increased more than 23%. So versus our poll, the NIK in at 251 crore view, working with a number of 235 crores. The profit is at 141.7 crore. We are working with a number of 143.1 crores. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, moving on, Tata Coffee actually reported some margin pressure this time. Surbi is here to tell us about that, as well as how Maharashtra seamless numbers look this time around. Surbi, over to you. Tata Coffee reported a weak set of numbers. Even though the revenues were up nearly 31% on a year-on-year -year basis, the profitability EBITDA was down 20% on a year-on-year -year basis at 82 crores. The company management says that the inflation pressure cost continued this quarter as well and further the profitability was affected due to high coffee input prices and because of the uh, lag in pricing recovery, the profitability is expected to be better in the second half of this fiscal. Next is Maharashtra Seamless, where the company reported strong results and this was driven by the seamless segment of the standalone business. The revenue was up 48% and margins were also stronger at 17.4% versus 15% same time last year. On the profitability front, the seamless segment drove profitability, where the EBITDA close to doubled at 163 crores and then in the United Seamless um, business segment, the EBITDA grew nearly four times on a year-on-year -year basis. The ERW segment, that's where the profitability was a little weak and it came in at 1 crore versus 19 crores last year. But still, strong results from Maharashtra Seamless. Thanks for that, Surbhis. Tata Coffee, a bit of a downtick and uh, Maharashtra Seamless could open up in the green. But let's hop across to Sonal. She's standing by to tell us about Gujarat Gas and AstraDM. Morning, Sonal. Good morning, Nigel. Starting with Gujarat Gas, uh, some positive news there as the Gujarat government has cut down VAT on PNG and CNG prices by 10% to 5%. So this reduces tax on CNG by 5 rupees per kg and on PNG by 4.3 rupees per SCM. It'll help a company like Gujarat Gas to actually pass it on to consumers and improve their volumes which have been under some pressure lately because of higher prices. Moving on to Asta DM, uh, the retail arm of the company, Asta Pharmacy has entered into a long-term joint venture agreement with Al Hoker Holding Group. This is to set up and operate uh, pharmacies in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the partnership together plans to set up and operate 250 plus stores over the next five years. So that stock remains in focus as well. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, Vivek is also with us. He has a couple of stocks on his radar. Vivek, what are you looking at this morning? Well, good morning. A couple of stocks on the radar to keep an eye out for. You know, some operational updates and some news flow coming in. LJVN is the first stock. Now, the company's arm, LJVN Green Energy, has gone ahead and signed a pack for a thousand megawatt solar power project uh, in the state of Assam. So now the uh, LJVN is going to invest almost 6,000 crores for this particular project. Next on our list is Adani Transmission. Some strong, uh, you know, positive momentum seen as far as the operations of both the transmission as well as the distribution business side is concerned. Operated transmission lines upwards of almost 99.76%. And when it comes to the distribution business, you know, the distribution utility rose almost 13% on a year-on-year basis. The company also managed to minimize the distribution losses coming in at around 6% versus northwards of 7% last time around. Very interestingly, the other stock to keep on the radar will be Container Corporation. Expect some green on the screen over here. Now, the company has 
actually manage to give an improvement in total throughput in the you know 20 foot equivalent that is the unit that is used to measure this particular segment it is up almost 16.6 percent on a year on year basis you know brokerage house nomura has also written a note they are saying that this indicates that the company has managed to reverse the market share loss and nomura is expecting strong results as far as this particular quarter is concerned for uh, for concord on the back of this particular operational update okay thanks a lot for that well in case you missed out on any of the stocks here they are the stocks with positive news flow this morning the z entertainment maharashtra seamless gujarat gas aster dm SJVN, Adani Transmission and Concord. While stocks with negative news flow today, there's some more than Madison, Canfin Homes and Tata Coffee. But let's get a quick handle on what's happening in the world of commodities. Brent is back at $92 a barrel. But Manisha Gupta, commodities editor, is here to tell us all that's transpiring there. Manisha, good morning. Morning, Sonia. Thank you for that. Well, it isn't starting as a very strong day for many of these commodities. Yesterday was good and is the reason we are holding around that 92. But when you look at the screens right now, there's a bit of a tepid move, sell-off also coming in for many of these commodities. So the true price is just about holding in the green right now. The U.S. gas prices fell 7% overnight. So overall, the energy pack has seen a bit of a decline. When you look at distillates, heating oil, all of that has seen a decline as well because there are forecasts of milder winter and above normal temperatures in the next couple of months. And that's seems to be weighing on. It's the same scenario for other industrial commodities where you have seen metal prices continue to decline today as well. The China zero COVID policy and most uh, US as the earning numbers start coming in. So you have BHP, Rio Tinto all telling you that they expect weak shipments among weak industrial global activity and that's weighing on. So whether it's rubber, which is trading at a five-week low, or a cotton, which is trading at a one-year low, across area, uh, uh, the industrial commodities are trading on a weaker note. All right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. So that's uh, metals in focus. Welcome back. A positive overnight handover is what we're looking at. Dollar index cooling off. SGX Nifty for starters is indicating a 150-point gap up. Sustaining that, most crucial. For the time being, let's discuss a few stocks. And to do that, we have Deepan Mehta, director at Elixir Equities, who joins us on the show. Hi, Deepan. Well, in the next few minutes, we'll actually see a large trade on Z. And the stock could be down close to 100% or just going by the discount. What's your sense on this space? There are synergy benefits that will play out once the merger comes into play. And also the company will get a relatively higher multiple. Are you enthused? Oh, yeah, Nigel, thanks for having me on your show and good morning. Yes, I think after many, many quarters of dismal news flow from Z, maybe uh, when the merger actually takes place, will be some uh, will inject some positive sentiment to the stock. Uh, clearly, I think uh, the MNC tag should uh, command a higher price to earnings multiple. And maybe investors will forget uh, the last quarter, June, June quarter, which was quite dismal for the company. And this festive season is shaping up well for advertisers. So I think Z should do well for the September and December quarter as well. And uh, let's see what the progress is being made on Z5, the OTT offering. Yes, but you're right, absolutely, that there is certainly a case for multiples to move up uh, in a post-merger scenario, given the dominant position of the merged entity within the media space. So you could have a nice trading rally up to the time uh, when the uh, stock actually gets this uh, traded on a merged basis. <clears throat> okay, uh, <clears throat> that's Z. Uh, Deepan, hi, good morning. Uh, what about Canfin Homes? That's the other one, right? Around which there was uh, so much uh, uh, hand-wringing and confusion. Uh, now the numbers are out. Have you given them a look? Yeah, Prashant, good morning. Not uh, that much in detail, but clearly there is no adverse outflow of the departure of the CEO. And at least there doesn't seem to be any corporate governance or any uh, negative news flow on that count. Valuations have corrected significantly over the past few months. Uh, and I think that be being the kind of company it is, it's a very good housing finance company, having kept its nose completely clean right through all the uh, trials and tribulations of the NBFC industry. And given that CanBank also is a sponsor bank, so it shouldn't have trouble raising resources. We are quite positive on the stock, and uh, even if the results are, are soft as the market perceives it to be, the going forward, the potential is exceptional given the volume uptick which we are seeing in the real estate industry. And I think P multiples price to book also should revert back to normal. So I think very positive for uh, Canfin shareholders, and the stock may up for over the next uh, two, three months or quarters or so. Okay, uh, Dipan, hi, good morning. The other stock in focus this morning is TVS Motor. In fact, there are two upgrades that have come in in the last two days on TVS Motor. So just wanted to get that on board. This morning, UBS has raised their target price to 1385 from 1100 <coughs> on TVS. They're saying that the company is racing ahead in the electric vehicle segment and is assuming segment leadership there. 
They expect five electric vehicle launches over the next 12 to 15 months from the TVS stable. And the premiumization of the IC engines will also cushion margins against any EV losses if they come through. Uh, they've raised their EV volume estimates as well. Yesterday, in fact, a dam capital uh, upgraded the earnings of TVS Motor, upgraded both FY23 and FY24 earnings by 13% each. And they say that there's strong volume outperformance that TVS is seeing. And there's a 270 basis points market share improvement in the scooter segment year to date in FY23 so far. And they've revised their target price higher to 1400 rupees. Uh, Dipan, you know, TVS is the only two wheeler maker that has expanded its presence in all the high growth categories, whether it's premium motorcycles, scooters, electric vehicles. Um, do you think the best is yet to come, or is all the good news in the price? Good morning, Sonia. I think TVS is an amazing company and it's not just uh, what they have done recently, but over the years they've expanded uh, capacities, they've tried to work on exports and they are present in every sub-segment of the two-wheeler space. And that clearly has benefited them, but also it trades at premium multiples, equivalent or higher to Aisha Motors and certainly a considerably higher price earning multiple than Hero Motor Corp and Bajaj Auto. And it's for these valid reasons which we just spoke about. But on the whole, I think we expect that the two-wheeler space is going to get crowded with new players coming in the uh, EV segment. And keeping the valuations in mind, uh, we like to be a bit cautious on TVS motors. Existing investors can remain invested and, you know, you could see uh, at least next two, three quarters, maybe two, three years do well for the company. But from a fresh investment perspective, I think there are better ideas within the auto space, auto, auto ancillary, which may outperform TVS motors as well. So that's the view at this point of time. Okay, that's the view on TVS Motor. We have many more uh, stocks to ask you about. But in the meantime, we're also going to talk about um, move to the pharmaceutical space. Biocon Biologics has entered into a strategic outlicensing agreement with the Japanese pharmaceutical company Yoshindo for commercializing two of their biosimilar assets in the Japanese market. Now, Ekta caught up with Shriha Stambe, the president and deputy CEO of Biocon Biologics, to discuss the key highlights about this deal. Let's listen in. This is indeed a, a very exciting uh, announcement for us. As you know, Japan is the world's third largest pharmaceutical market at almost uh, $80 billion in, in uh, revenues. So clearly, uh, it's an important market for us. And uh, what we've done uh, through this um, uh, deal is we've out, out licensed two of our very exciting biosimilar assets, uh, biosimilar to uh, Stellara, which is uh, Ustekinumab, and biosimilar to Prolia Exiva, which is uh, Dinosumab. And we've partnered with uh, a leading uh, Japanese player uh, called Yoshindo Inc. And we're looking to, uh, to really bring this asset to uh, patients in Japan to address uh, you know, these uh, un unmet needs in bone health and in immunology therapy areas. Uh, we understand that, but I just wanted to understand, would you need to conduct separate clinical trials for this Japanese approval or to roll out these two biosimilars in Japan? So we announced somewhere uh, you know, at the end of last financial year that we are in the middle of our global clinical trials for both these assets. Um, and we would be looking to uh, completing Ostekinumab N23, Dinosumab N24, and we are in uh, conversation with the Japanese regulator to see if we could use this data along with whatever needs to be satisfied for Japan so that we can bring these uh, uh, trials to, uh, to uh, these products to Japan as quickly as possible. Okay. When can we hear about the closing of the Viatris transaction? Because that was estimated to take place in the second half of the fiscal. Where do things stand? Uh, what I can say at this stage, uh, without getting into specifics, given that we are in the in the in that uh, window where we where we, we can't divulge much, is we are on track, progressing well, and we should be able to share more information with you in uh, in in due course of time. Okay, so it is still expected to close in the second half. Yes, that's what we've said. Yes. Okay, so there's no timelines in terms of change there. Uh, what about the SIRIM transaction? Because there was expected to be some amount of PE funds raised and SIRIM was probably expected to commit more funds, maybe even raise their stake. Uh, can you tell us where things stand currently on that front? So again, uh, the SIRIM uh, transaction is again expected to close in the second half of the year, starting October 1. And again, we've 
uh, you know, we are in fact for that uh, uh, pending all our uh, regulatory approvals, the deal will be effective October 1. So I don't think there's any change with that. Uh, we've also said that uh, uh, there will be a, a equity placement in the deal going forward uh, by our existing investors, uh, and that continues to be the case. Okay, when does that equity placement close by? Yes, that should be a part of what uh, will be required to close the, the overall Beatrice deal as well. All right, so, so it should probably close in the second half of this fiscal. That's correct. All right. Uh, if you could just leave us with an update with regards to insulin aspart as well as Bevasi Zumab, these two biosimilars, what is the status of approval on both of them? So as you know, these uh, both these uh, products were inspected by uh, the uh, FDA. These are both assets which are approved uh, by EMA already. Uh, so we have the approvals of these products by the European Authority. The FDA inspected us um, earlier uh, in, in the quarter. And uh, after they've inspected us, we have responded to the observations that the agency had, uh, had made after the inspection. And we're looking forward to their uh, response post that. So we are right now awaiting their response to, um, to whatever we've sent back to them uh, after their observations. Any timeline uh, that you're expecting an approval by? Uh, we always stay hopeful. Uh, it really depends on, uh, the, there's no fixed timeline at this stage on when the agency is required to approve. But we had, we had said we should probably hear something before the end of the year. But we, we, we can't really commit on behalf of the agency. And we'll wait for that. Uh, that's uh, my colleague Ekta taking us for the conversation with Biocon. But look at the market. The SGX indicating a nice start, a 150-point start, uh, almost a 1% gain, uh, and right up to important resistance levels, which is basically uh, the 50-day moving average, 17 491, I mean, 17,500 broadly. That's uh, the level that you want to see the market above. Uh, Deepan Mehta, of course, is still with us. Deepan, uh, you know, Tata Alexei sold off aggressively yesterday, right, on the back of that uh, earnings miss for the first time after two years. Uh, any, uh, would you want to wade into that name or any other IT names? See, by and large, I think Midcap IT has delivered uh, on, on its promise and their growth rates have consistently been higher than large cap IT. They've been able to manage their margins also far better because of operating leverage and other uh, strategies and steps which they may have taken. And we remain very positive on uh, niche IT companies which focus on specific verticals which are in high growth or have IP type of businesses. And Tata Alexi certainly fits that particular bill. And yes, I know, I think the numbers are a little soft and disappointing, especially quarter on quarter. But management commentary is very strong. Yeah. And we do expect that eventually earnings will be sustained at around these levels. And you may have sideways movement for maybe a few months or so, but the underlying business model is exceptional and it will continue to trade at very high PE multiples and it's a great secular story. So we remain invested in Tata Alexi. Maybe fresh investments could be made only after we see a resurgence of growth over there in that company. Other companies we've spoken about in the mid-cap IT, which we're very positive on is Persistent Systems as well as KPIT. Intellect Design has not done well, but that's one company which we are monitoring quite closely. And post-merger, I think Mindtree and LTI could be quite interesting given the numbers which came out were exceptionally good and they have amongst the best-in-class growth rates. Yeah, Deepan, I want to ask you about another stock, Pidilite. You know, yes, it was very strong, was up closer on 2.5%. The hope is that maybe if HDFC makes its way out of the Nifty temporarily because it's going to be a merged entity, <laughs> then this one could be a new, you know, nifty entrant. Uh, for many uh, reshuffles, we've been hoping that it happens. I mean, that's what, uh, you know, the numbers suggest. Any view on the stock? See, I think it's been a great value creator and entry into nifty would be most appropriate given the track record of the company. It's just that it's always traded at a very high price to earnings multiple and that makes it very difficult to buy at these levels. But I think existing shareholders such as ourselves, I think best to remain invested uh, company continues to perform exceedingly well and now with raw material prices cooling off, you could see expansion of their operating profit margins. And given the kind of position the company has within the industry and the way real estate uh, industry and overall uh, office and home renovation is picking up, I think these are great times for Pedalight Industries. It's just that the valuation, which is around about 80 to 100 times or so trading 12 months, that is what is a, a major mental block 
into making further uh, further acquisition of shares of uh, petrolite industries. Uh, I wanted your thoughts also how to approach Reliance Industries ahead of its earnings on Friday, Dipan. This time around, the expectation is that there could be a double-digit decline in the EBITDA compared to last quarter, purely because of lower GRMs as well as the windfall tax. Um, how are you approaching the stock as a long-term investor? Would you change your stance in anticipation of weak numbers or, or do you add here? What's the thought? See, this is what Reliance has done strategically right, is that from being too uh, too much into a cyclical business, and that was a situation three, four years ago, earnings were totally dependent on GRM margins and how the petrochemical business performed. From there, over the last three, four years, uh, I would say five years, the majority of the revenues and the valuation now comes from its subsidiary companies, uh, digital company as well as retail company, and now there is new energy. So that's where the focus is going to be, and that's what drives the sentiment in Reliance Industries as to how the new businesses are shaping up, uh, how how they performed quarter on quarter, what are the qualitative metrics, uh, how that has changed. And the key question in Reliance still remains how that uh, the value in those subsidies is going to get unlocked. If it is going to be just a pure and simple IPO, then Reliance Industry will start suffering from holding company discount. But if there's a split in the company, then that will certainly uh, create significant value for minority shareholders. So I think that's the key question, Reliance Industries. I think from a long-term investor's perspective, unless you don't have clarity on how the value is going to be unlocked, you remain invested. But from a fresh investment perspective, I think it's better to wait for this particular uh, corporate announcement uh, before uh, committing more, uh, more investment into Reliance Industries. Welcome back. Uh, so the SGX is indicating a start at 17,466, 150-odd points higher. Uh, it's looking bright and uh, green, uh, which is the way uh, we like things. Mitesh Tucker is with us. Kush Bora is with us as well. Uh, gentlemen, good to have you with us here. Technical trading ideas uh, in uh, focus and the setup broadly. Uh, Mitesh, uh, to you first. I mean, we'll uh, basically open uh, around uh, very close to the 50-day moving average. What should one do? Wait for dips intraday to uh, try and buy the market? or uh, buy at those levels? I mean, if you get that 150-point higher start. Morning, Prashant. Uh, I think uh, buying on a mild dip may not be a bad idea. But uh, basically, we have been trading with more of long bias. So I think, you know, on the Nifty, I'm now looking at a target of around 17,580. So if you get it, get an entry closer to about 17,400, 420 zones, you know, after the gap of opening, if you get a 50, 45-point kind of a dip, uh, use that to buy and keep a stop below 17,350. I think 17,580 should be the near-term target with, with a good chance of 17,750, 800 being visited. Uh, the financials and the bank nifty should outperform as they've been doing for the last few days. A lot of buy calls on the banking side yesterday also and today also we have. But on the bank nifty levels also, I'm looking at a 40,500 being tested. So yes, clearly trade with long buyers and wait for a dip of about 45, 50 points post the opening to buy into indices. All right, uh, so 17,800 could be visited on the upside as well. Kush Bora is with us. Uh, Kush, are you as optimistic? Do you think that the market is headed much higher or would we stay in this range? And what are the markers according to you for both the Nifty as well as the Bank Nifty? Sure. Uh, hi, Sonia. First up, good morning and thank you for having me on the show. Uh, well, I am, uh, you know, uh, a lot more optimistic, but just for the week, you know, we might stay in the range. Uh, 17,500 is where we're opening. And, uh, you know, if you look at the options data, then 17,000 put and 17,500 call have a very significant pace. So while I may not look to go short because the global market momentum is also now adding to, uh, you know, to the rally that we are seeing, but I would for now, uh, you know, book profits, you know, at 17,500 levels and look to re-enter as Mitesh said, you know, maybe 50 or maybe 100 points, you know, lower from uh, these levels. Now, what one thing that I will also watch for is the 17,500 call option shedding any OI during the day. If that happens, then the though, you know, then a small window opens for 17,700, 17,800 levels. But if in case that doesn't happen, the 17,500 call witness is a lot of strengthening, then we might, you know, perhaps be in the range, at least for the week, you know, as the uh, weekly options data is indicating. One very good thing that has happened is the duo of crude and dollar index. Both have cooled off a little, and this could act as a much needed trigger for, uh, you know, the Indian markets to rally higher. Bank Nifty obviously is doing, you know, a great things and it'll continue. 40,400, 40,500 is where we see the Bank Nifty headed. So, uh, you know, stay long on Bank Nifty, but Nifty for now remains a hold. Okay, all right. Uh, you've given us your view, Kush, on uh, both the, the indices. What about individual stocks? Sure. Uh, in fact, one of them is, you know, a stock that you discussed just a while back, which is Pidilite. The stock has formed a very strong base at 2,600 levels and is now seeing, you know, uptick with, uh, you know, some good volumes. 
So this will remain a buy. For an interim basis, immediate basis, the target would be 2750 and the support will be, or the stop loss in this case would be 2660. Uh, the second stock is something that you know, I've um, discussed a couple of times over. HBL Power, the stock is uh, showing very good traction. The volumes are also picking up. Here, the immediate target would be 130 and the stop loss would be 110. And what about you, Mitesh? Um, I have all buy calls, a couple of them from the banking side. Uh, ICICI Bank is a buy with a stop at 877 for targets of 909 and Bank of Vododa, we, we had a call yesterday as well, now can be bought afresh with a stop at 134 for targets of 142. That apart, BHL is making a very good uh, price pattern, so this uh, could go up to about levels of 68 to about 69 on the upside, that's a buy with a stop at 61.5 and Bharat Ford is a buy with a stop at 760 for targets of 800. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good to speak to both of you, Mitesh and uh, Kush. Mitesh, uh, speak with you a little later uh, uh, for more in terms of uh, trading uh, ideas. Z, the block deal has uh, kind of gone through. 5.25 crore shares have changed hands. Uh, and uh, OFI Global is likely to have sold 5.5% stake in Z. This is what we were highlighting earlier, uh, that uh, this should happen. <clears throat> pre, uh, you know, sort of uh, pre-marketing the block block deal window, so it's out of the way uh, in that sense, and that uh, no overhang really during market hours. So 264 on Z, we'll see how this uh, opens up. So much uh, sort of uh, has happened with Z since that uh, initial proposal with Sony was announced. I mean that fight with uh, you know a large fund Invesco, and there was uh, so much back and forth around this. Uh, but you know this the CCI approval came through, the shareholder approval has gone through, and now. Uh, you know, we got uh, this one out of the way uh, as uh, well. This uh, block deal uh, has also gone through. Manoj Murli Dharan is with us, Vice President Derivative, uh, at Derivatives at Relegate Broking. Manoj, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. How is the setup uh, looking? And uh, what's the best way to get uh, long exposure here now if we do get that 150 point higher start? Uh, good morning, Prashant. Uh, Prashant, the, the difference here we have here is uh, this uh, the next uh, week, which would be a monthly expiry, is a truncated one. So we would see the rollovers picking up. And uh, IDD, uh, though the index starts at 10 to 50, not question that happens usually after the uh, previous week expiry, that is Thursday. We have already seen that. So I believe this uh, potential or this breakout that is uh, we have seen in the Nifty has legs to extend all the way to 17,650 to 700. So a better way is go for a 27th October, let's say a 17,500 strike for an option buyer who can buy that and simply carry it till the monthly expiry, the targets on the Nifty will be 17,700. Else, if it's a future state, you can certainly buy that. The support for today would be somewhere close to a 17,300 to 350. Uh, uh, with a stop loss of let's say 17,200 and say in the target of 17,600. Uh, the important thing here is every time the bank Nifty backs up the Nifty, you know, you, you see the trend has got strength and I guess uh, at least in this month of October, from the last uh, 10 to 8 or days, we have seen that the bank Nifty has been at par or maybe at least outperforming. So we're expecting closer to 41,020 or let's say around 41,000 as a target on that. So even that, a 27th October strike 40,500 call option can be bought this morning after the gap of open. And what about individual stocks? Uh, stock specific, we like SBI Life. We have seen uh, fresh long built up in the stock. We expect SBI Life would be somewhere close to around 1220 as a target. We uh, we can buy it at current market price once the uh, uh, market opens up with the stock plus somewhere close to 1187. The second stock that we like would be Tata Motors. We believe that the stock has a potential to go to almost 420. So either go with a 400 call strike option, you got it for around nine rupees, or you go long on the future for a target of 420. The stock plus here would be 392 on the stock. Okay. All right. Manoj, thanks so much. Good to hear your thoughts early this morning. By the way, just keep an eye out on Z. I think that could be one of the big stocks of the day. Large trade taking place out there. Massive open interest build up. And there was some buzz for the last few days. There's likely to be a large trade taking place at a bit of a discount. It's happened in pre-market. So we'll have to keep an eye out. Will the shots run for cover? Most important. That's likely to be the case today. Slip into a short break. Come back. We'll focus on uh, the cement space. We have a few numbers that are coming in there and they've been very disappointing. Mangesh Badang of Nirmal Bang Institutional Equities will be joining in to give us his take on the sector.